Good morning. Uh, my name is Amory Fiore. I'm a neurosurgeon at ONS, and today I'm going to talk to you about lumbar microdiscectomy outcomes and techniques. So uh, what we're talking about is lumbar radiculopathy, which is uh, pain, numbness, or weakness, or some combination of those secondary to a lumbar disc herniation. Um, the lumbar disc is the cartilage joint in the lumbar spine and the low back. And you know this picture here demonstrates a lumbar disc herniation. A piece of the cartilage inside the disc breaks out and pushes against the nerves in the spine, and that causes uh, the symptoms. And so lumbar discectomy is the treatment, surgical treatment for that problem. Um, first, a little anatomy. Um, the peripheral nerves in the legs um, go up to the spine and form the spinal nerves, which are inside the spine, and then those connect to the spinal cord and go up to the brain, and uh, the sensory signals travel up those nerves uh, from the legs through the spinal cord to the brain, and motor signals to make the muscles move travel the other way. Uh, the spinal nerves uh, are numbered based on the vertebral bodies, and different spinal nerves uh, go to different parts of the legs in terms of uh, sensation, and that's also where uh, different um, pain distributions apply. Uh, this is uh, to demonstrate the anatomy of the lumbar spine. Uh, the lumbar vertebrae are the bones, and they stack up on top of each other, and in between each ver two vertebrae is a disc, which is the cartilage joint. Um, the vertebrae have an opening in the middle, which is where the nerves or the spinal cord, depending on the level, uh, sit. And so stacked on top of each other, uh, that forms a, a tube or the spinal canal where the nerves sit. And the disc is directly in front of the space where the nerves are. And here you can see in sort of a three-dimensional view, the thecal sac, which is the sac that contains all the nerves and individual nerves, and then nerve roots come off of that sac at each joint level and then go out to your uh, legs. And uh, the whole thing is surrounded by bone, and in between uh, each two vertebrae in the back, there's also a ligament. So the intervertebral disc anatomy is uh, important. Um, a lot of people use the analogy of the jelly donut where the jelly inside the donut is the inside of the disc or the nucleus. And when you have a herniation, the jelly comes out, um, which is sort of imprecise, but um, gets the point across. Uh, the disc has two parts. The outer part is the annulus, which is uh, a tough kind of cartilage that uh, is like layers of an onion, and it's strong. and it contains the nucleus, which is a softer, less structured form of cartilage inside, which people think of as the shock absorber. Um, the annulus actually also attaches to the bones above and below, um, and the nucleus sits inside of it. Um, so here we're looking at uh, lumbar MRI imaging, which is important because uh, this is uh, the imaging that we use to diagnose lumbar disc problems and, and to treat them. So uh, this is an MRI image of the lumbar spine. Here we have the head, the feet, front and back. So this is looking from the left side. Um, you can see the discs, which are light, and the bones in between. This is the space for the nerves. The white is spinal fluid, and the nerves are dark. And then this is just a diagrammatic representation of the same thing. Uh, this is the other uh, view that we use, which is an axial image. So in this view, this is the front, back, right, and left. So in this view, it would be as if you were standing at someone's feet when they were lying on their back and looking up through them. So it's a cross-sectional view. And so here we have the disc in front, and then the sac and nerves here, and the little dots are the individual nerves. So a lumbar disc herniation is a de degenerative problem. Uh, sometimes it may occur because of trauma. A lot of times it occurs because of bending and lifting. 
uh, bending over and lifting puts a lot of stress on the disc and will often cause a herniation. Uh, sometimes there's no injury and it just happens spontaneously. Um, it's an, a kind of arthritic problem where the cartilage degenerates over time and then can break down. Uh, the peak incidence is between age 30 and 50. Um, the symptoms are caused by nerve compression uh, from the disc herniation squeezing the nerve as well as inflammation secondary to that. And people often wonder about the terminology of a bulge or a disc, uh, bulge or herniation or a prolapse, uh, all different terms that are illustrated here and they're really not important. It's really just a question of whether the disc is pushing on a nerve or not. And if it's not pushing on a nerve, it's typically not gonna cause symptoms. Uh, this again is a demonstration of a disc herniation and you can have disc herniations that occur in different anatomic zones. So you can have a disc herniation which is more on the outside of the spine which will get the nerve coming out at that level or more commonly you can have a disc herniation inside the spinal canal which uh, gets the nerves inside and um, that will give you different symptoms depending on where it is at a particular level. Uh, the symptoms are typically pain, which could be a stabbing or electric or burning pain, uh, sensory symptoms, which are numbness or tingling or vibrating, sometimes people describe, um, and then motor symptoms, which are muscle weakness, um, typically uh, such as a, a foot drop where you can't bend your foot up. That's the classic symptom of an L4, L5 disc herniation. Um, so here is a image of a lumbar disc herniation on MRI. So this is a cross-sectional image. So the disc is here, and this is the sac of nerves, and you can see the uh, herniated disc, which is on the right side. So the disc here, the dark part, is what's pushing on the nerve and causing the symptoms. And then this is a, another view. This is a sagittal view from the side. So here you can see a disc herniation, which is clearly you know, protruding and is pushing on the nerve, and then a cross-sectional view again. So the non-surgical treatments for lumbar disc herniation are uh, physical therapy, and that can include things like heat, ultrasound, electrical stimulation, massage, um, and very importantly, specific back exercises, uh, some of which can specifically help with pain, some of which are for core strength or flexibility. Uh, there are other things that therapists will do, like dry needling and uh, other techniques. Um, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, are used typically, and they reduce inflammation and can help with pain. Uh, oral steroids are used very commonly. Um, they're a much stronger anti-inflammatory, which uh, often will help significantly with pain. And then epidural steroid injection is an injection of steroid where the nerve is being squeezed. That's done by a pain management doctor. Um, and it's essentially targeting all the steroid to that one spot to uh, have more of an effect. Um, other treatments include chiropractic treatment, spinal decompression, acupuncture, inversion table, traction. Um, those are things that sometimes may be effective as well. So a lot of disc herniations get better over time. Uh, the lumbar disc cartilage has a lot of water within it, and when you have a herniation, a lot of the time that piece of cartilage will dry out and shrink and go away, and that happens very commonly. Uh, things like PT exercises and traction might coax the disc away from the nerve a little bit, and by doing so, reduce the symptoms. But most of the time, uh, I think resolution is because the disc shrinks uh, or, or dissolves by itself. And if you have an epidural injection that doesn't shrink the disc, it reduces inflammation, and that can help with pain. And that buys you time. And if, if you have enough time with pain control, then the disc herniation may go away over that time. And about 80% of people that present with a lumbar radiculopathy have resolution of symptoms without surgery in about the first three months. Um, so the indications for surgery are failure to respond to non-surgical treatment, typically for about six to 12 weeks. Um, the Exact duration depends on how bad the symptoms are. So if someone's having very severe pain, they may wait for uh, less time than someone that has less uh, severe or more tolerable pain. And that becomes a quality of life issue depending on how bad the pain is and how it's interfering with your life. Some people will give it more or less time and that's uh, a personal decision. Um, the second indication for early surgery is if you have incapacitating pain, you can't take it, you can't stand, you can't walk, you can't work, you can't care for your children. Um, things like that are reasons that uh, surgery is done early because 
uh, surgery will typically result in very immediate relief of pain. And the third indication for early surgery is if you have a neurologic deficit, meaning weakness like a foot drop um, or weakness in any muscle which is controlled by the nerve that's being compressed. And if you have some mild weakness, usually you can get away with treating that non-surgically, but if it's severe, we worry about people developing a permanent uh, deficit or permanent weakness from nerve damage if, that's, if you let that go for too long. So uh, the treatment that I use is a minimally invasive lumbar microdiscectomy. And so uh, what's done is I make about an 18 millimeter skin incision and we put dilating tubes down to the spine. You start with a small tube and then you put progressively larger tubes over it. And what that does is it splits the muscle, which um, is structured that in a way that's amenable to splitting without cutting it. Um, and then after the last dilator, you put a working tube in that goes down to the spine and then you work through that tube with a microscope. And so, you know, this is actually the tube that's used and this is, you know, the view looking down upon it. This is in the operating room, so I use an operating microscope, which uh, is a 3D view of the spine, and uh, you can magnify to a very high zoom. Um, and this is the view down the tube at a high magnification. And you can actually see this is the, the nerve, uh, the thecal sac, the, the sac of nerves towards the middle. And then this is actually the nerve that's coming out. And then here is the disc, and there, a discectomy has been done, and there's a hole in the disc there that you can see. And this gives you an idea of the trajectory we're taking. So I'm looking through that tube. You do have to remove a portion of the lamina, which is the bone that overlies the sac of nerves, and that's why you know discectomy is often called a laminectomy, because a laminectomy is part of a discectomy. Um, once you have the tube in and you do the laminectomy, we use different instruments like pituitary rongeurs, which are grasping instruments, to reach down inside and grab uh, pieces of the disc and remove them. And so typically you remove most of the nucleus and very little to none of the annulus, um, which means about 30% of the disc is removed and there's some variation depending on anatomy. Some people have more or less uh, nucleus, but um, Certainly, you do not remove the whole disc, which is a common question that people ask. So this is a outpatient surgery. It takes about an hour. Um, a, a healed incision is about that big, it's less than the size of a quarter or about the size of a penny. Um, there's no stitches or staples to remove. Um, it heals quickly, faster than open surgery. There's a lower infection risk. Um, there's less pain and a shorter recovery than typical open surgery. Um, I encourage walking the same day, and there's no limitation on that if you're doing well. People can shower the next day. Um, often people have immediate improvement in nerve pain. A lot of times people will wake up and say that horrible pain is gone, although they'll still have some back pain from the surgery and may still have some residual pain for a few weeks. I'll usually wait about four to six weeks before starting physical therapy. And uh, depending on how you're doing, if your pain is uh, relatively minimal, I'll so at some point along the way let you start working with an elliptical machine or a bike or even light weights or swimming. Uh, the big thing is you can't bend over at your waist. You can't lift anything heavy because those are the things that um, put the most pressure on the disc and increase the chance of another herniation. And at, at about three months, people can return to most sports, including golf, tennis, and running. And, you know, for an uncomplicated case, um, the success rate, in my experience, is greater than 95%. So what are the complications? Uh, there's about a 10% chance you can have another herniation. Um, so we're not removing the whole disc. Uh, you're removing uh, most of the nucleus, but um, it's difficult to remove every last bit, and, and you don't want to remove too much disc because that causes other problems, including um, back pain. So it's still a mobile joint and it's a weak spot and so you can have another herniation. And if you look at the literature, the number's all over the place. It's between about one and 21%, but I think 10% is a reasonable number. And that could be you know, in years or if you're unlucky, it could be you know, in a week or a month, um, but that's pretty uncommon. Um, there's about a 2% chance you could have bleeding or an infection or a spinal fluid leak where we have to go back and uh, do surgery to repair it. Uh, the nerves are in a sac 
uh, which is contained by the dura, which is a sort of leathery membrane. And if you get a hole in that sac, then spinal fluid from inside leaks out. And if you don't fix that, that can cause either headaches or can leak uh, through the skin and require a repair. And so we can do that minimally invasively too. Here's a picture looking down the tube at a leak that was repaired with uh, some suture through the tube. And then there are, you know, some complications that could be related to med med medical problems or anesthesia if you have pre-existing uh, health conditions, um, heart conditions, things of that nature. So um, the biggest study of lumbar disc herniation was the SPORT trial, which it was a randomized study of 501 patients. And uh, the outcome was not very clear. Uh, at about two years after surgery or after uh, onset of symptoms, most people improved regardless of whether they were randomized to surgery or not. But this was criticized broadly because about 60% of the people randomized to surgery went to non-surgical treatment and 43% of the people randomized to non-surgical treatment went on to get surgery. So that really confused the outcome. So um, it's difficult to draw any real conclusion from that. Um, this is a meta-analysis where uh, the authors looked at the timing of surgery, and what they found was that the longer, longer the duration of symptoms, the less favorable the outcome. And they suggested that outcomes may be worse after about six months of uh, symptoms if surgery is not performed. And so this gets to the question of nerve damage. Is it possible the nerve will be damaged by prolonged compression, and will that result in permanent weakness or permanent pain or permanent sensory loss? And uh, you know, the problem is, is that sometimes that can happen, and sometimes it doesn't happen, and everyone is different. Uh, so some people with a foot drop may get away with it and get better without surgery. Other people, if they wait too long, may end up with a permanent foot drop, and it's difficult to know who's who. So that's why if someone has a severe deficit, you know, we'll recommend surgery. Uh, this just indicates what the outcomes can be like. This is a meta-analysis where they looked at uh, lumbar discectomy in elite athletes. And so 75 to 100 percent of elite athletes were able to return to elite competition after surgery, and they were able to do that for an average of 2.6 to 4.8 years. And they reached 64 to 103 percent of their preoperative uh, statistics in terms of performance. So that just demonstrates that this is a successful procedure that holds up over time, even under the demands of athletic activity. And then this is a sub-analysis of the sport study where they looked at different factors that affect outcome. And there are many factors that affect outcome. So there are certain things that are very um, uh, common that will reduce the outcome rates, such as if it were workman's compensation, the, the success rate with surgery is known to be um, much lower. And that's been demonstrated over and over. Um, things like uh, body mass index um, and other uh, factors also contribute. So there are a variety of factors that contribute to outcome. So in conclusion, uh, so lumbar discectomy is a safe and efficacious procedure for relief of leg pain, sensory loss, and weakness secondary to a lumbar disc herniation. Um, in the absence of a significant neurologic deficit or incapacitating pain, most patients should undergo six to 12 weeks of non-surgical treatment before considering surgery. Um, early surgery is indicated for a significant neurologic deficit or for incapacitating pain. Um, outcomes may be affected by the duration and severity of preoperative symptoms or presence of a neurologic deficit. And prolonged non-surgical treatment may result in poorer outcomes than uh, or, uh, surgery done earlier. Thank you very much.